Hi, everybody. Uh, we are the Wildlife Wire, and we are here with episode four of Wildlife Biologists Rank the Animals of Planet Zoo. Um, just to give ourselves some brief introductions for anybody that hasn't watched our previous episodes. My name is Dominic Noche. I received my bachelor's degree in wildlife biology from the University of Montana in 2021. And I have before then and since been working on loads of different projects with medium size and large carnivores, actually ever since I was 16 years old. And I'm currently working on medium sized carnivores in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. I'm Justin Ruby. I also graduated from the University of Montana uh, with a bachelor's in wildlife biology. Uh, I've worked previously as a research technician, writing papers, and most recently I've done a significant amount of science education. I'm Lane Arthur. Um, I also graduated from the University of Montana with a uh, bachelor's in wildlife biology and parks tourism and recreation management. Um, I've always been interested in studying wildlife uh, ever since I was a kid, and I'm currently working with the Forest Service uh, as a wildlife technician. And today we will be looking at the red fox, which is a species that most of you in our audience probably know very well. It is a very widespread and successful animal, not just um, geographically, but also in terms of habitat. And it is a species that has done really well with human urbanization and human habitat conversion. So that really gives this a different outlook to a lot of the other animals that we've addressed in that people have a lot of personal encounters and personal experiences with this species that we're gonna talk about. And we do have a lot to cover because of that. So uh, get buckled in and we'll get started. So I think, First off, just looking at this fox, um, what are just some things that you guys are noticing about the model to start off? Um, I think overall, like the the black fur on the ears looks really nice. Uh, same with the white tip on the uh, tail. It looks a little... I'm trying to find the right word less vibrant than some of the foxes I've seen in the wild. Yeah. I mean, I think overall the body plan is pretty good. I think this is probably our first big example of the eyes really looking cartoony. Mm -hmm. um, and I think especially on some of the fox models, it just makes the face look really odd, in my opinion. And that's just because I've done a lot of carnivore work. I don't, they have, most carnivores, they've got like a fairly like sharp gaze. And I think with the red fox, especially just compared to the other carnivores that we've covered so far, it's really noticeable. Yeah, I was going to say it looks, yeah, like they could have spent a little bit more time on the details, but uh, yeah, overall. I think it's, it's also not, part yeah. of their style. I, when mm -hmm. we start covering species that are more in the base game, like that is a very big consistency that Frontier seems to have, especially with the carnivores that they have more cartoony faces and cartoony eyes. Um, and that's something that a lot of the modders have been trying to fix. Um, but I mean, again, at the same point, you know, Red Fox has a lot of variety. So I don't think that the overall coat color and the, you know, the fur amount and detail is necessarily bad. It's just, it's fairly reflective of one particular area when it's found in tons of different areas. So just to give an understanding of the geographic range of the red fox. It is found across basically all of Europe, um, a large portion of uh, northern and central Asia, um, even into southwest Asia through the Caucasus Mountains down into parts of the Middle East, uh, and even into northern Africa, um, not in the Sahara Desert, but in the parts where the climate's a bit more mild, and they even will follow the Nile River down through Egypt into Sudan. So this is a species that has a very big distribution in the old world. And then even in the new world, they're found in parts of Alaska and Canada. Um, and as of now, due to range expansion with human habitat conversion, they're found in most of the United States as well. So 
very, very adaptive. Um, but one thing that we do see with these guys is, yes, they're able to be found in forests. They're able to be found in grasslands, you know, somewhat arid climates, mountains. You know, they, they're, they are in a lot of different areas. But when it comes to what we consider kind of fine scale habitat preference, you know, where they are preferring to have their home range and where they are spending most of their time and feeding, they are quite water dependent. And that is something that I will talk about right now in the sense that everybody, when everybody hears the word fox, they think of the red fox. And yeah, the red fox, it's found in so many different areas. It's close to people. It's the fox that everybody's exposed to. And it's kind of made everybody think that you just have this one fox running around. And it's one of the gripes that I have with the red fox. Actually, don't get me wrong. It's a very amazing animal. But there are so many different fox species. And they all kind of fly under the radar because of the red fox. And that's just, that's just like a little pet peeve of mine. Because I'm, you know, always trying to tell people, oh, look at all these other foxes that are really cool and do different things. And everybody focuses on the red fox. So... The red fox overlaps with tons of different fox species. In Central Asia, you have the Corsic fox. In the Middle East, you have the Blandford's fox. And in North Africa, you have the, the Rupel's fox and the Fennec fox, which is which is also fairly famous. And in North America, you have the you have the gray fox in the forest, you have the swift fox in the plains, the kit fox in the deserts, Arctic foxes in, you know, up in the Arctic Circle. So these are all foxes that are somewhat overlapping with the red fox, and they're more specialized. And usually a lot of these foxes, one of the best ways that they're able to niche partition or, you know, try to avoid competition with the red fox, because the red fox is, is one of the larger fox species. So they can outcompete them when it comes to a fight, but you want to avoid fighting, as we've stressed a lot throughout this series. A, a lot of these foxes, they're much better adapted for being away from water for long periods of time. And that's being more dry habitat adapted is one of the best ways to kind of deal with being around um, this huge generalist that is the red fox. But that is just something that we see across all different habitats. And it really does show, you know, hey, you can have a lot of these small foxes in a lot of the same areas as long as they're doing different things and because the red fox is the generalist it gets all the attention but you have all these other foxes doing different things but still behaving very similarly and it's an important thing to kind of understand and it could lead to you maybe having a new favorite animal because you learn about these other types of foxes and that's always a cool thing to have um, another thing with the red fox is not only is it a generalist in habitat and in location, it's also a generalist in diet. So this guy will eat just about anything that it can catch. And they're not even just carnivores. Uh, they are technically omnivores. They eat a considerable amount of plant material that we would classify them as an omnivore um, just because it's very unlikely for an animal to be a truly strict carnivore or a truly strict herbivore with red foxes they eat mostly large amounts of fruit and the amount of fruit that certain populations of red fox eat is enough for us to really consider them to be mostly an omnivore however they do prefer to hunt most of their nutrition that they're getting is from meat and a lot of that comes from rodents rodents are a big portion of their diet. They're abundant. They breed quickly. It's a very good source of food. They're in just about every environment. So being able to eat a lot of rodents is a great way to find food. Um, but that being said, they're also capable of hunting lots of other things, including ground birds, um, rabbits. Rabbits are a bit bigger, so they're harder to catch, but they can provide you with a larger amount of food. Um, as we've said before with our other carnivores, these guys will kill some of the smaller carnivores like a lot of the weasel species, not just uh, as an opportunistic meal, but also to eliminate competition because they're also hunting things like birds and small rodents that these foxes also want. Things like frogs, small reptiles, insects, you name it, anything that's going to fit down that 
red fox's mouth that's going to try and eat. But even some bigger things, such as uh, small deer fawns, um, very young uh, boar piglets, um, even waterfowl. You know, these guys will hunt, you know, ducks that are fairly equal in size to them. And those are all part of the fox's diet. It's got a very broad range of diet. Even in some urban areas, they eat a good amount of um, feral baby feral cats. So it really just kind of depends on what food's available, what can I exploit, you know, what is going to get me my nutrition at the end of the day. And the red fox is really, really good at kind of seeing what different options it has. When we're talking about the hunting behaviors of the red fox and how generalist it is, you can really find one of the cool um, behaviors, like their, their classic pounce uh, when they're hunting like rodents, especially under snow where, you know, they're, since they're a canid, they're going to use their nose a lot to find their prey. And then since they have these, you know, nice large ears, they can also use that to help pinpoint exactly where, like, a uh, rodent is underneath the snow that's kind of, you know, tunneling. And so what they'll do is they'll essentially, like, you know, start searching, and then they'll stop. You'll kind of see their ears swivel around as they're trying to locate it. And then right when they're pretty sure they know exactly where it is, they'll do a little hop up. And then their whole body, like, the whole front of their body will just fall into the snow not all the times catching the rodent find prey in pretty unique ways yeah actually an interesting thing to add uh to the statistic is there is um you know not a huge but there is a increased chance uh that they will be successful doing uh what we call that mousing sort of behavior there is an increased chance of them being successful when they face north hmm. so there is some hypotheses that maybe this is do, they're using actual you know magnetic um inferences to kind of help pinpoint where those small rodents are buried in the snow which is really really interesting and it's not a sense that we always think about you always hear about the the five senses but there's a lot more senses that we can't really describe that you know not just you know different animals have but you know even things that we have uh so the the whole five senses idea is not exactly accurate and this is a great example of animals using some other sense that we don't really think about in their daily lives as a way to obtain food yeah another thing to add to that i was when i was doing my research on the red fox i found that uh, when they stash their food sometimes they have a great uh, sense of memory and direction of coming back to that area exactly where they stashed it so just kind of having another sense of being able to, you know, know the landmarks and understand like where their area was, where they stash their food to come back to. Yeah. And being a generalist, you've got to really know how to move on the landscape. And the other thing with the red fox is that it's fairly small for a carnivore. And we've covered two other carnivores that are larger in this series so far. And we did mention that both of them will opportunistically kill red foxes when they have the chance the eurasian lynx more so than the amor leopard uh, but the red fox does have a whole host of larger carnivores that it has to watch out for in its day-to-day -day life and the eurasian lynx is a is a major mortality risk for red fox in a lot of its range um, as well as two larger canid species so in parts of Europe and Asia, you have the golden jackal, which is a medium-sized canid. And in North America, you have what is basically that same equivalent in the coyote. Those are two of your biggest limiting factors on red fox populations because uh, they really go out of their way to eliminate red fox. There's just so much prey overlap between the two of them. And red foxes can also pose a threat to young golden jackals and coyotes. So they really make a considerable effort to remove red foxes off of the landscape. And that can have some benefits and it can have some hindrances that we'll get into later. But even with some of these larger carnivores, you know, big cats will kill them, wolves will kill them. But there's still a huge benefit to red foxes to be in landscapes with these bigger carnivores. And that's because these big carnivores leave carcasses. And a red fox can exploit those carcasses from scavenging. Why go out and put all this great deal of effort into 
hunting something when I might not be successful or food might be really scarce or I'm, you know, I'm trying to kill this big duck that could hurt me. You know, those are all things you have to consider as a predator. But with red foxes, they can walk fairly efficiently. Canids are, are built to walk over long distances fairly efficiently. And you've got a good sense of smell. If you find a carcass that you can feed on, there's great advantage to getting that. It's good resources for you to feed on. And so in the Panthera Teton Cougar Project, which is something that I had been following ever since I was a kid, um, there was a lot of carcass studies that happened from a man, a researcher named Connor O'Malley, who's a fantastic, fantastic researcher. And one thing that he looked at was red fox activity at uh, cougar kills in the Teton Mountains in, in Wyoming. And he found that scavenging off of cougar kills was a very important food source for a lot of red foxes in the area, especially during winter when resources were scarce. And not only was it an important food source, but due to their smaller size, these foxes were able to feed on the carcass in pretty close proximity to when the cougar was around. Because they had GPS locations from, from the cougars. The cougars were radio collared. So they knew how far away the cougar was when these foxes were coming in and feeding on these kills. And it shows that these bigger carnivores, they have more of a tolerance for these smaller carnivores that they really only see as an opportunistic meal rather than something that's a bit bigger like a coyote where they're more keen to just go out of their way to remove it to eliminate competition. So having these much larger carnivores on the landscape can actually help benefit red foxes because one, they're going after things like coyotes and golden jackals that limit their populations more severely. And they're benefiting from this new food source from these big carcasses being left around that they can scavenge on. Yeah, and that also speaks to why diversity in the landscape is just so important. Because if you have a diversity of habitat, you can have a diversity of you know, predators, prey, and with even among the diversity of predators, they all, like you were saying, impact each other differently and not only impact each other, but impact like their prey species as well. Right. And even just how foxes adjust to resource availability is really important. Another study that I was reading in the UK was looking at fox territory size in certain grassland areas where they would do a lot of stalking of upland game birds. So upland game bird hunting is a pretty popular pastime in parts of Europe and North America. And in some of these areas, what companies will do is they will breed uh, species like pheasants that aren't native to the area and they will stalk them. They will release them on these properties for people to hunt. Well, you're going to also have predators taking advantage of this new food source that's in the area. And so when you have this constant replenishing of prey and making an area that ordinarily wouldn't have this prey source really prey dense, the foxes are able to have much smaller territories than they normally are because they have this constant source of food coming in. And so you actually create this situation by stocking these birds on these grasslands where the fox population is is denser and there's more foxes within this area than there would normally be in a, a healthy environment. And so you have to consider those sorts of issues. And so when when hunters complain, oh, foxes are, are killing too many birds, well, understanding the ecology and the relationship and how having you know resource limitations on your prey also puts resource limitations on your predators and removing those pressures is going to cause all sorts of populations to increase to levels that aren't exactly what they would be in a more contained, more, more normal system with, with different types of diversity as well. The other thing that they were mostly hunting were hares. And even though these fox populations were super high, the hares, they breed multiple times a year. They have very large litter. So the hares were able to deal with the fox predation quite well and that's just due to all these different adaptive strategies that they've learned to since they've been heavily targeted not just by foxes but by tons of different predators and it's what has allowed hares to survive as well as they have so as we've talked about red fox is really really adaptive animal it's found across a large geographic range 
And, you know, as, as we've said, there's a lot of good things that foxes do for these environments. Um, I think one thing that I would like to cover right now is public inquiries and a lot of phone calls from the general public just day to day. And one of the biggest things that we always get calls about is people having foxes living in their backyards and living under their sheds. And it's always negative. And it comes from just a lack of understanding on how this animal operates. So I think this is a great opportunity to have some sort of public PSA on just what it means to kind of live alongside foxes and really what you should be thinking about. And I think to start off, foxes are no danger to people. These are animals that you know, are about five kilograms, 10 pounds, give or take, way too small to do damage to a person, even even a child, you know, it, you're, you're, uh, most children are big enough that a fox is not really that much of a threat to them. And it's very easy for you to share your landscape with a family of foxes for a summer. And the reason that we have foxes living in such close proximity to people in these urban areas is because they're more afraid of things like coyotes and golden jackals than they are of people. Even if people might have a higher mortality on them, they're more afraid of those larger predators than humans. And so humans keep the coyotes and the golden jackals away at least a little bit. And so that, that brings in the foxes closer. But foxes, you know, it's a it's a mated pair for life and they will breed every year around late march early april is when the kits will be born but you probably might not see them for for another month because with carnivore babies they're born blind and deaf um rather helpless so the mother's going to keep them well hidden so you might see her moving around but you're not really going to see those kits until about may maybe even into june for the most part and mom and dad are working tirelessly to feed and guard those kits. So you're probably only going to be seeing one adult around at a time. And the other adult will be staying and guarding the kits and they'll take it in shifts. And the kits will grow and they'll grow larger. And usually, I, I would say around this time of year, so around um, in, in July, um, you know, late June, early July, the kits get big enough that they might move away from that initial den site and go make a new sort of den that's called a rendezvous site. That's a bit more of a bigger open area, but still with cover for the kits to hide in. And that is a really good area for them to start learning how to hunt and practice their hunting skills on insects and other small animals that might come by as the parents are able to leave them alone for longer periods of time to continue feeding them. And once you start getting into September, October, the kits are going to be about fully grown. And not much later, they're going to disperse, they're going to leave their parents, and they're going to go out to try and eke out a territory and find a mate of their own. And that's a very normal thing to happen. It's perfectly you're, you're perfectly capable as a human being of, of sharing your backyard with a family of foxes raising their kids. Um, you know, mother foxes and, and father foxes, they can look a little intimidating if they feel that you're getting too close to their kids. But I think all of us here can respect the fact that that is parental instinct. You're going to protect your babies. But at the same time, Every fox knows that they don't stand a chance against any human. They're just so much bigger that it's not worth the risk. So it is very much a bluff and it's an intimidation display. And it's just saying, hey, you're getting a little bit too close. And people can have established boundaries within their yard using things like your garden hose or buying one of those small air horns from, let's say, uh, a boating store or a, or a marine store, those are good ways of establishing your boundaries, even just uh, standing loudly, waving your arms and shouting. You know, those are those are some great ways to kind of establish boundaries with the fox, but the fox and maybe the foxes are stressed enough that they find a different place that they want to be raising their kits because they say, hey, I'm getting harassed a little bit too much. Let's move somewhere else that might be a bit more comfortable for us. But that's a much better alternative than calling your state agency and saying that you have a fox problem because foxes are a very successful species and 
there's not really any place that we can put them there. If we put them somewhere else, chances are there's already a fox family there. There's coyotes. Um, they could cause problems for other people. So in these situations, they get euthanized. And that's, you know, not really what people want to hear, but that's why you need to learn how to share the landscape with them. And foxes do provide a lot of great benefits. One of the things that I always tell people here in the Northeastern United States is that foxes are one of the best species to combat Lyme disease. So as I said, even though they have such a large range of things that they eat, fruits, insects, birds, fish, amphibians, they're mostly eating rodents. And one of the most common rodents is the white-footed mouse, which is an animal that is a huge reservoir for Lyme disease. And it's where a lot of ticks actually get Lyme disease is these young ticks will suck the blood of these mice and they'll get the Lyme disease from there. Red foxes kill and eat a lot of white-footed mice. And so if you have foxes living close to your house, it's gonna mean fewer Lyme disease infected mice in your area and it lowers the chances of you getting Lyme disease. So that is a great example of something that you are benefiting from those foxes being just on the landscape doing their thing. And so wouldn't that qualify as like ecological service? Yeah, I, I consider that an ecosystem service because you're reducing disease risk. Yeah, reducing the risk to humans from Lyme disease. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's a beautiful thing. And so there's a lot of good things that foxes do, but there's also some bad things that foxes can do. So because they're so successful, um, if they're in an area that they're not supposed to be in or that they're not native to, they can cause a lot of problems. So there is a place that I think people are expecting us to talk about. But before we talk about that, um, there are just some places with human colonization and habitat alteration. Red foxes have expanded into places that they used to not be in, especially in North America. And one example for that is Southern California and parts of the desert Southwest where people brought water into these areas that you, you normally didn't have that much water. And so the native kit foxes, very well adapted to desert environments, don't need that much water. But now all of a sudden you have these red foxes, these larger red foxes coming in that are able to use that water and they're pushing kit foxes around, they're killing kit foxes. And so that is, is a worrisome sign for the kit foxes. However, luckily, you also have coyotes in those areas, and probably thanks to coyotes, these kit foxes aren't outright being completely pushed out because they have, they're have they better at dealing with coyotes than these red foxes are. And so even though coyotes aren't great for kit foxes in the grand scheme of things, it's actually helping them stay on some landscapes because they're also attacking and, and killing these these red foxes that ordinarily wouldn't have been in, in this environment and are only in it because of human influence. Climate change is another thing that we worry about as red foxes spread north interactions with Arctic foxes. It seems to be kind of a mixed bag where red foxes are bigger than Arctic foxes. They're definitely capable of killing them. We have recorded evidence of that, but in some other areas, it seems like the winters can still be harsh enough that there is still some good resource and, and fine scale habitat partitioning between red foxes and Arctic foxes with little to no conflict. But the big one is Australia. So Australia has obviously been isolated. Everybody knows that Australia has weird animals, very unique animals because of its isolation. But when the British colonized it, they wanted to be able to fox hunt. So they put foxes on Australia. They also brought them to North America, actually, but um, those populations didn't really interbreed that much with the native North American red foxes. And, and we've seen that in some genetic studies because people have questioned how much uh, European fox DNA is in the North American populations, and it's not that much. So Really, the range expansion we've seen in North America is from the, the native subspecies of red fox there. But in Australia, not any foxes, not any carnivore like a red fox. And with the native species that you have there, the rodents, the marsupials, the birds, the lizards, everything, most of that stuff just gets absolutely hammered by red fox predation and it's a huge problem and you're losing tons of different unique species that aren't found anywhere else to these overrun 
red fox populations that the British turned loose when they were colonizing Australia. And it's one of the major problems alongside feral cats. Feral cats are also a big problem there. And I was reading that even that red fox populations even have an effect on gray kangaroos, an animal that's one of the biggest animals left in Australia. You wouldn't think a red fox would have an effect on that population, but from attacking the juveniles, they can actually uh, decrease gray kangaroo population growth, which is kind of crazy to think about. And that's just how crazy of an effect these these red foxes can have in Australia. And yeah, it's it's an animal. It doesn't really know that what it's doing is negative, but it just goes to show that an animal can be a great thing to have on a landscape in an area where it's native, but in an area where it's not native, it can become what we call an invasive species and it can be really detrimental to the environment. And, and it's a problem that humans cause. So we have a responsibility to kind of clean it up. And while it's not what people would might necessarily want, you know, eradicating these foxes is going to save tons and tons of native species. And so that's kind of the big struggle right now with a lot of Australian conservation programs. Absolutely. And then, you know, from our research, one of the other things we found was dingoes can play a role in, I guess you could say, regulating red foxes in Australia, where when dingo populations are declining, we actually have increases in these invasive uh, red fox populations. So we're kind of seeing a similar aspect to where the coyotes and the jackals are playing a role in maintaining the uh, specific density of red foxes in their native habitat. But in a non-native habitat, they may be playing a role uh, or a similar role, despite never historically encountering the species. Right. And this is something that's going to come back up whenever we do the dingo video, because it just highlights the importance that the dingo does play on the landscape. And there's a lot of controversial management decisions happening right now with dingoes. And mm -hmm. this is a huge benefit that dingoes provide is that they are very good at keeping red fox populations down. And so if you're targeting, you know, eliminating red foxes, but also keeping dingoes on the landscape, that goal of removing them entirely from that area becomes a lot more feasible. And that's something that we should be striving towards for sure. Um, and I do actually, I don't know if either of you have heard of this story because it is kind of fairly recent, but there was um, a red fox. Um, so there's a reserve in New South Wales that was trying to make this isolated area from invasive species so that they could start reintroducing a ton of native species that they had lost. Um, I know Bill, uh, species of bilby was the first species that they were planning on reintroducing. And so they erected this fence to protect this area. And they still had a couple of foxes and feral cats left in, in the area, but they were, they were quickly getting rid of most of them. But there was one fox that was left. And this fox became so infamous at evading, you know, traps and poison and dogs and everything uh, that he ended up being named Rambo. <laughs> and he eluded death for five years. Um, and he was easily recognizable in all the camera traps because he had torn up ears from killing the last feral cat that was stuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is you know this is a crazy fox and this just shows the the survival instincts and the adaptability of the red fox that he put this reintroduction project for bilbies on hold for five years and it wasn't until this past winter that he died in the floods that they had had in in new south wales and they didn't even declare officially that he was dead until march because they wanted to absolutely make sure that he didn't just pop up on cameras before they release the bilbies. So they've started releasing bilbies. They've got a ton of other native species in this preserve, and they've already seen that that elimination of invasive species, as well as the fencing to prevent new ones from getting in, has worked great effects where you're seeing 10 times as many as some of those native species inside the reserve as, as outside. So it really is important work, and it's not something that we should really doubt that yes you want to be removing some of these invasive species for sure and that is an important part of conservation is understanding where certain animals are supposed to be or not and and helping manage that accordingly and fixing 
human errors that were made in the past. So um, uh, just another to... thing to always bring up about red foxes is this is kind of a poster child species for media hysteria when it comes to rabies. So media exaggerates rabies. It doesn't really understand how rabies works and anything that you really see on the news is it's it's not technically wrong, but it's it's exaggerated to the point that it might as well be wrong. Uh, rabies is a fairly rare disease in red fox, and the it's not something that you can really effectively diagnose the symptoms in the field. You'll get these calls about, oh, well, there's a rabid fox in my yard. Well, how do you know it's rabid? Oh, it's out during the day. Well, that's that's not indicative of it being rabid. The fox could just be comfortable around people and feel safe moving around during the daytime. That doesn't make it rabid. Uh, another thing you always hear is, oh, the, the fur is patchy and mangy. Well, that's not rabies either. That means it has mange, which is a skin parasite that comes from, from mites irritating the skin. And if you have a big enough infestation, it can mean that you lose almost all your fur and, and maybe even die if you're in poor body condition. Um, mange is it's what we call scabies in people it's the same exact thing same exact parasite so it's the same sort of disease but we have different names for it in people and animals and i don't know why but those are not signs of rabies and if you do look at records of rabbit animal attacks especially with rabbit foxes is it's a fox that nobody's ever seen before that just comes out of nowhere and immediately bites somebody with no provocation you know at all whatsoever it's not something you know by the time it ha you're worried about it it's already happened and the other thing to remember is that rabies is a fatal disease so by the time the animal starts getting symptomatic it's probably going to die pretty soon and what we have been seeing in europe is that they have an oral vaccine that they've been feeding the foxes and it's almost nearly eliminated rabies as a problem in Europe, as opposed to the United States. Even in the United States, it's not a huge problem in foxes. It's it's more of an issue in some other species like raccoons and, and skunks and bats. But in Europe, it's not really a problem. And it also highlighted some of the importances that we brought up in the lynx video of allowing that carnivore community to stay intact and allowing those resident predators to hold on to their territories because what they found is that the the rabies vaccinations were more effective if you were able to vaccinate those resident territory holders because they were also preventing all these other foxes from moving around and when animals move around like that they can spread diseases more easily so it's really interesting work that europe was able to do with these rabies vaccines and i don't know if it's something that's going to be replicated in north america or in other parts of red fox range but it again just shows that you know diseases can come from humans interfering with wildlife populations and and skyrocket and sometimes it really is best to to leave them alone and you actually get fewer issues so red fox is a species that does have a lot of different coat color variations so right here we have what is called a cross fox and as you see, there's quite a bit of, of black in it. And just like with the Amor leopard, this is something that we call melanism. So you will see some foxes, they're actually called silver foxes for some reason, even though they're black. I think it's because of the silver fringes um, at the, the fur tips, but uh, silver foxes are just a melanistic red fox. It's, it's the same sort of genetics where they make a lot of melanin and it turns their fur black. Um, what we see with the cross fox is something called pseudo melanism. So the melanism hasn't taken over everywhere in the body. So you still get those kind of red, orangey brown patches. And that's what makes the cross fox. These are all still red foxes. They're not different species at all. It's all still within Volpe's Volpe's, which is the, the scientific name. And that's a fun scientific name as well, because it's the the genus and the species together, just like with the Eurasian lynx, uh, which is something called tautonomy. That's the technical word that we use for when a, a genus and a species epithet are, are the same word. But we see, you know, these different types of coat colors and it's increased in prevalence because people like these coat colors and they will selectively breed for them in fur farms for the fur trade. 
Uh, so that makes these coat colors a bit more commonly known to some people. And you also can sometimes get some albino foxes. Uh, we weren't able to get it here, but there is the piebald fox, which is kind of some light red, li light orange, as well as um, bits of white. Um, and it's all kind of patched in together. Uh, Justin will probably find a photo of it. But that is a super rare color morph that, as far as I could tell, has only been documented in the UK. Um, and I will say, I kind of like the cross fox um, design more than the the typical red morph. I think they did a better job with the cross. I agree. Yeah. Like the eyes look less cartoony on the cross. The face looks a little less boxy, which is kind of one of my issues with the other one, which maybe it's just the cut like way the looks with the coloration, but yeah. And it like it, it's at least distinct enough. I think in some light angles it kind of looks like a gray fox, mm -hmm. which is a different species, but I, I think there's enough differences for you to tell that it's not trying to be a gray fox. Yeah. Um, I agree. It's a really good yeah. really good variant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then do we have do we have the silver or no? No, this is the only other coloration I have. I liked I, I've looked up pictures of the silver and I like the cross better. I think the okay. silver has some of the same problems as the normal red fox. Mm -hmm. Um but we can yeah. we can jump to one of the kits as well. Um okay. Looks like you did a good job on the legs there, but with the amount of black that goes up on the legs, mm -hmm. the, the legs are super black on the kits, you know, higher up than you'd think. Uh, the tail is super black as well. That's usually what we see in kids. Proportionally larger head, which is something that I've always brought up with, with baby animals, is they tend to have proportionally larger heads that they grow into later. Um, and the, the muzzle seems short. I mean, I don't think this is as good as the Eurasian lynx kitten, but I think this is pretty good for a baby. Yeah, I, I think the the movements look pretty pretty solid for you know a young fox. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the kind of tail not being super bushy because it hasn't fully grown out yet. Right. And I mean, like, you could argue it's like kind of big for like the growth stage that they're going for. I think is like maybe my one criticism. Mm -hmm. And I think at some angles the the face does look a bit, you know, less juvenile and more adult, but like the muzzle's still short, which I think helps. What are what are your thoughts, Lane? Yeah, yeah, I think um that face is a little bit more mature looking to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, like Dominic said, the muzzle's shorter, so that helps with it. Yeah. Yeah. The coloration's it's good, I think. Yeah, I like that it's it's kind of got that lightery kind of like yellowy orange because that is something mm -hmm. that we kind of see in the kits. Yeah, and you can kind of yeah, see that the defined. the dark uh pattern on like the back of the ears hasn't fully descended till it near the base of the skull or you know to the skull yet. Yeah. And yeah, he's kind of he's kind of like a sausage as well. He's <laughs> yeah. pretty yeah. chunky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And eating good. Yep. All the food that the parents are bringing back for him. Yep. So do we have um? Do we have the kits in the other? We have one? it in the uh cross. Um. Okay. I think this one's not as good as the adult. <laughs> <laughs> um. That face looks kind of off. It's not bad. I think I don't think it's as good as the red. I think the red's got the better juvenile and the cross mm. has the better adult. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. yeah. The face just like I can't really describe it, but it just it looks off. You know, not even just for a fox, but for a canid. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of. It kind of reminds me of like the South American foxes, which which aren't foxes, of course, but it, it's kind of like that sort of clade, I guess. It's kind yeah, of a vibe to me. To me, it almost kind of looked a little hyena-ish. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I think I think the ears kind of like pull it away from me thinking mm -hmm. that fully. Yeah, because the ears are very dog-like. Yeah. Um, 
yeah i can kind of see, like it, it kind of the the muzzle looks a little robust i can kind of see what you're saying there yeah and in a lot of places they do very very well you know in urban areas they can do pretty well um as long as you know around water they can do really well but one really kind of odd population is the sierra nevada red foxes um so these foxes live at high elevations in the sierra nevadas and they are kind of unusual because with this population it's believed to be threatened and and some consider it the most potentially the most endangered mammal in north america because there was less than 20 individuals at the start of a study and i believe 2010 i think they're really difficult to study because they live at these high elevations that are really difficult to access as you know a person you can set camera traps which you know those work really great but at that low of a density the chances of these foxes coming across them is unlikely so one of the ways that they do study them aside from occasionally getting observations from just the public which are encouraged by the california department of fish and wildlife is they use conservation detection dogs that are trained to locate the scat of these foxes so they're able to go on surveys the dogs and their handlers uh, traverse the landscape and once the dogs indicate on a scat the handler collects it and they send it off to a lab and they're able to do genetic tests to further understand uh, what remains of this population. And one of the groups that does this a lot is road detection dogs, which has worked all across the world on projects with tigers and all kinds of carnivores. Yeah, they've done some blackfoot ferret stuff too, right? Um, I, I don't know if they have. I know the uh, Working Dogs for Conservation has done blackfoot ferret work. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and like the cool thing about the Sierra Nevada fox is that's the type of habitat that red foxes were initially living in before human urbanization and then they were just able to do really well and and move into some of the more of these low-lying areas with the habitat conversion that humans did yeah so it is pretty unique in that regard um i was also seeing um red foxes listed as near threatened in pakistan so mm -hmm. there are some areas where they're not doing super duper well and yeah. you know that could be just due to the available habitat and how much the red fox range actually goes into that country but it kind of shows don't just look at what the global conservation status is you gotta kind of look more fine scale and see okay how well are these animals doing in in these areas just because it says lee's concern doesn't necessarily mean it's doing well exactly so that's, that's always something to to take a look at um and another thing i wanted to mention about the coat color variation is that the the melanism that we see in cross and silver foxes is mostly in north america in terms of where it's found in the wild uh, as well as the caucasus region those seem to be the two major hot spots for seeing those uh, color morphs in red fox in the wild okay um okay so i pulled the red fox out to start off um so who wants to go first Lane, i can go, go first, first. Yeah. yeah um I think for me, I'll, I'll probably put in the B tier, uh, just because I don't think it's as great as a couple of the, the other animals that we've been looking at so far. Um, like you mentioned, Dominic, the kind of looks a little bit cartoonish. The colors are pretty good, um, uh, but for me, I think I'll probably put it in the B tier, just based on the other animals. Yeah, I personally agree 100% with uh, placing it in B tier. Um, it looks good. It doesn't look quite right. You know, I think um, it's just kind of what happens a lot with video game animals. Their coats, to me, a lot of times just aren't entirely representative of how we see them all the time. Mm. Um, I think the coat is a little, well, maybe a little sleek. I, I get that this is most likely, you know, a summer coat, nothing to... Uh, like fluffy and everything but i think kind of the face is a little boxy to me um and color wise it's just not the the base kind of most common coloration the red you know the red that makes it the red fox just mm -hmm. doesn't look right to me personally so i would have to place it in the b tier as well 
Yeah, I was actually, I think, I think the the cross kind of saves it for me. I think otherwise I would have put it in C tier. Mm-hmm. So I'm fine with putting it in B tier as well. But really, it's because of the the cross fox. I think the the adult cross fox looks, you know, it's not perfect, but it's it's pretty good. And you know, I think that that's fair enough for B tier. I do have quite a few gripes with the um with the basic red morph. I think that probably of the species that we had been getting in some of the newer DLCs, I do think the red fox is one of the weakest in terms of design accuracy, um, which is kind of surprising because it seems like they put a lot of work into it. You know, it was kind of a, I mean, they use the raccoon as more of the like flagship for the Twilight pack, but I feel like the red fox was a big, you know, popular pack seller for it too. So, um, you know, it's it's good, but they definitely could have done a lot better and i think it it's definitely worse than the other three that we've reviewed so far i would say so if we're comfortable with that are you ready to spin the wheel oh Oh. Nice. Okay. Southern white rhino. Okay. A I'm nice excited uh, for this one because there's something that people believe so much about rhinos that isn't true, and we get to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a fun one. Uh, really, uh, very different change of habitat. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I think yeah, this will be it'll be very conservation based, which is going to be great. Um, for sure. So. Well, that's all we have. Um, we'll see us for our next video on the Southern White Rhino. Uh, this is the Wildlife Wire and signing off. See ya. Adios.